I'm going to do something a little bit bizarre here. It was inspired by how Andy Matuszczak recently did some did a live stream of himself just like taking notes and writing in the morning. And I wanted to do a variation of that. So here, um, someone, uh, David Perot, he just asked me uh, recently to review an article uh, that he wrote about applied behavioral science. He asks, is applied behavioral science reaching a local maximum? And uh, is applied behavioral science reaching a local maximum? And I wanted to just like, I don't know, uh, give it give it a little bit of thought and think out loud as I'm giving him feedback and as I'm connecting this with my own notes. So as you'll see here, um, I actually already got started on this article. Um, I'll kind of like sum up what we've seen so far. So basically what he's saying is that applied behavioral science, it's been focusing a lot on existing. Uh, think it's been focusing a lot on what's been existing, right? So like we've had these frameworks that we've been using for decades. We've had tools and methods that we've been using for decades, right? And we're starting to proliferate. Um, there's a lot more contexts in which applied behavioral science is getting used. But because we're using these decades old methods, we're mainly just like, optimizing. Um, and when you're optimizing, that kind of assumes that what you're starting with is already um, the best thing to start with. So uh, that kind of that should bring you up to speed a little bit so far. Uh, so now I'll just show I've got my I've got a note open open for is applied behavioral science reaching local maximum. I just uh, made a page for it. Author, that's David Perot. Um, I've actually like already responded to, this was like based on a Twitter thread. So I'm just gonna pull up the link references for that. And as I'm going through this, I'll probably be like reviewing that and seeing how my thoughts from that Twitter thread uh, because, of course, like I commented on the Twitter thread, like, see here, I, you know, I, I marked everything with hashtag C that I commented with. And yeah, so I'm probably just going to be like bouncing through that as I'm going. But yeah. OK, so now I'm on now I'm on this section. What's holding vertical progress back? A lot of this is probably just going to be me. Um, silently reading, or I could read out loud, might as well. Uh, like many others, I've been surfing the early innovation waves created by the field's founders for the past seven years, uh, tinkering here and there, generating buy-in and building capabilities that in competencies in younger practitioners. Uh, yet in recent years, I've become slightly skeptical that the propulsions created by those early innovations in addition to ongoing refinement, incremental optimizations, as well as the wide scale horizontal adoption is enough to keep the field expanding outward uh, to meet its potential over the long run. Okay, so he thinks that applied behavioral science has a lot further to go, um, a lot further to go and then it is currently and i agree with that you know like we've had a lot of horizontal adoption just meaning that like you know everybody's using it at this point right like it's in marketing it's in ux it's in um management um but it, it's mainly just been using what we've already been using and what we've already been using largely uh, this is my own running commentary on this, uh, is what we've, what we've been using so far is largely based on um, applied, it, it's largely based on academic studies, you know, and there, there's some limitations to that here. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to pull up my notes on this real quick. Products, 
to study people. Uh, this is one of those blog posts that you know I've been having in the works for a while, but you know never really got around to. Uh, let me pull up draft. Hmm. Price to study people draft one. Okay. Um, Maybe this one goes into my book. I don't know. Okay, people voluntarily use or don't you? What should you be studying? Open versus closed questions. Okay, I think I've got to go to. Okay, people voluntarily use or don't use this app. Uh, so some ideas that are within this, um, apps need to be desirable, experiments don't, uh, academia is trying to find generalizable principles, product people are not. Okay, yeah, so like with academia, something that they're generally trying to do, uh, which can lead to a little bit of loss in translation over to actual applied work is that Academic behavioral science, they're generally studying, they're studying, they're trying to find generalizable principles. And as a result, they're picking out like these, these samples of people that are meant to be representative of the population, the general population of people as a whole. Um, and they're also, they're trying to control all these variables. They're removing, uh, they're removing as many factors of the context as possible. Uh, but, you know, in applied work, what ends up happening is we're studying a specific group of people. And we're also, you know, in a context where there is a lot of context. Uh, there's a lot of factors from the environment that are contributing here. So I guess just all that is to say is that there's some differences between applied work and um, academic work in the fact that we're still mainly using what's come from academic work is perhaps lamentable, you know, or perhaps we're uh, missing the mark a little bit. Okay, I'm just going to collapse this real quick. Da, 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 da. My sense is, all right, we're one paragraph into this reading. Great. Uh, my sense is that a substantial set of new innovation waves are needed for applied behavioral science to continue thriving. Um, I decided to investigate, to understand where the challenges were and explore potential ways to solve them. Um, in doing so, I collated a set of technical and ethical limitations that are getting in the way of vertical progress. What I found was that almost all of these limitations are well studied and understood, and many of the proposed solutions to them have been around for a long time. Okay, so this may like at first glance seem like it's in conflict with what he was saying before, which is that uh, is that we're just using all the same stuff that we've already been using for a very long period of time. But I don't think this is actually in conflict because um, what he's also saying here is that the academic work that ends up getting applied to applied work is largely based on the frameworks that early practitioners were coming up with, right? So like here we've got, you know, like Ideas 42, they came up with a behavioral design methodology based a lot on, you know, like how design works, but also on like behavioral science academics. Then there's also stuff like the mind space framework, the behavior change wheel, uh, Cialdini, Robert Cialdini's seven principles. These are all things that like early practitioners translated from academia and they translated it like decades ago, right? And, um, and, and so all most of this, most of the things that we're using in applied work does come from academia, uh, but it comes from translations of academia. And so there's a lot of 
And in, in academic behavioral science, also, there's just so much that it's studied so far. <laughs> you know, uh, there's so much that's studied, so much left to study. And that also means there's so much left to translate, you know, that hasn't been translated. So we've been copying the translators, but not doing our orig- our own translations, I think, is why this isn't really attention with what he's been saying already. So why hasn't there been a significant innovation? As I began to step back and look at these limitations together as a broad system of related moving parts, the answer to this question became more apparent to me. The issue wasn't to do with overcoming each of the particular limitations directly. Rather, it was how the suggested resolutions influenced and constrained one another. Uh, That is to say that in certain cases, the suggested paths put forward in overcoming technical limitations, for example, were good ones, but because they don't operate in isolation, were heavily constrained by other limitations, especially those of a more ethical nature. The further we move down the technical progress paths, the heavier the ethical headwinds will be, making progress slow, effortful, and costly, if possible at all. Okay, so I might need to reread this uh, to understand it. So what I'm grasping so far from this is that, you know, he's identified a whole bunch of different limitations, right? Like, so uh, this is just from, like, his Twitter thread from a while ago, you know, replicability is a a limitation, unknown boundary conditions, cultural variation, etc. And he's saying that they're all... None of these things are problems in isolation. They are all problems in a system together. Uh, But I think he's also saying that ethical limitations are the bigger, uh, are the bigger constraint towards solving some of these problems. So let's reread this paragraph. Um, The issue wasn't to do with overcoming each of the particular limitations directly. Rather, it was how the suggested resolutions influenced and constrained one another. Um, Okay, so that's that's super interesting. I'm just going to write this down. Um, For all of the problems and limitations that he cites, there are pre-existing proposed solutions that may not have seen, may not have been put into practice so far. However, suggested is how the suggested resolution. Oh, yeah. However, each of these solutions already been proposed don't work together in isolation. don't work in isolation, they each impose new constraints, making effective innovation more challenging. Okay, um, and, and, and that's actually, that's a building idea, so I'm just going to do that as a child node. Um, one, one of the things that I like to do when I'm writing in Rome is I try to just use indentation as a way of communicating my intention to Rome. You know, like, so anything, so this here, this is a child node of this uh, parent node right here. And so I'm just saying by putting this as a child node 
that this is a related idea, uh, that this idea builds on this one. Um, okay, that's to say that in certain cases, the suggested paths put forward in overcoming technical limitations were good ones, but because they don't operate in isolation, were heavily constrained by other limitations, especially those of a more ethical nature. Okay, yeah, so I think I understood that correctly. Uh, that definitely took me a bit to wrap my head around, um, but um, but yeah. So I just want to write down real quick: um, ethical limitations in particular arise from solutions to technical limitations. Okay. Um, I'm just going to leave a comment for him real quick. Uh, this paragraph, I needed to reread this paragraph to understand it well. It may just be because at this point it's abstract, would like to see you revisit this claim as, as you go. Um, and I'm just going to also comment my notes in here uh, just to see if you know, my understanding of this is correct. Just to check if my understanding is correct. Okay. Uh, to explain how I reached the position mentioned above, I will unpack each of the technical and ethical limitations identified and the, okay, I should just comment um, then, uh, discuss the currently suggested solutions to overcoming them. Uh, I'll then step back and discuss how these suggested solutions come in conflict with one another restricting vertical progress and creating a local maximum in the process. I'll then explore the implications of reaching a local maximum. Uh, there's an interesting set of costs and benefits. Uh, finally, I'll share a set of potential paths fo forward worth betting on that may get around some of the sticky points discussed. Exploring these paths may be costly in the short run, yet prove to be fruitful over the long run. Um, I, I'm not sure if he, if you need to articulate this or if you should just do it. I mean, uh, that, that, I think that's a stylistic choice, though. Um, I mean, this is a really academic way of writing right here. Uh, because, I mean, like in academia, in the intro section for papers, it always just, like, goes very... Um, for the intro sections, they always, like, tell you exactly what you're going to see in the rest of the paper. Um, but... Feels very academic, but a stylistic choice on, on your Okay. Um, great. Technical limitations. Let's get into the first one. <laughs> uh, this is definitely slowing down the rate at which I read, but it's also, uh, this feels good. 
you know, like it, um, it feels as though I'm digesting the material a little bit more strongly by, by reading it, by talking it through with whoever's going to be watching this, uh, if you're insane enough to watch this, but yeah. Okay. So replicability first and perhaps the most familiar limitation to those working in the behavioral space is the barrage of research findings that have failed to replicate in recent years. Uh, this crisis in reproducibility emerged from a number of factors, but primary culprits were small sample sizes, outdated protocol structures, and questionable research practices. P-hacking, cherry-picking, etc. The incentives set up and social pressures created by the structure of the academic system didn't help either. Uh, novel, counterintuitive, and sexy findings hold more currency than trivial, nothing new here sorts of studies that may have more rigor to them. Okay, so just for a little bit of context, because this article is definitely like it's written for other practitioners, and other practitioners are going to know what the replication crisis is, but the replication crisis is referring to, you know, I think it was in 2014, uh, there was a wide scale effort to reproduce some of the most popular findings in behavioral science and uh, far less of it reproduced than we'd like to admit, right? And and, you know, I think that some of the factors that he describes um, are definitely some of what's going on here. You know, like p-hacking, cherry-picking. Yeah, those are, those are definitely reasons why we had errors with uh, issues with replication. But I also think, like, what I was talking about earlier is also a reason we've had issues with replication, right? Like, we've tried to study... Uh, samples of people that are meant to generalize out to humanity as a whole, uh, which, you know, you end up studying no one in particular in that instance. And we also tried to, you know, like remove factors of the context. And whenever, and, you know, like context, it matters, right? So anytime we're trying to replicate a study, we're going to end up having a new context. Uh, and... And if we're trying to remove all factors of the context and not apply it to specific contexts, then, like, honestly, what's the point of it anyway? Like, who cares about a statement that only works in a lab setting, right? So I think, I think those are some of the issues that happen with the replication crisis as well. Uh, I also want to highlight here... Um, he said, novel, counterintuitive, and sexy findings hold more currency than trivial, nothing new here sorts of studies that have more rigor to them. Um, I think, uh, you know, I'm just going to copy paste this in here. I'm going to call it a, a hashtag quote. And... And normally, like, I think it's probably better to rewrite things in my own words, but this is something that's throughout my notes uh, or throughout my thinking, you know, like, this is not a new point to me. Uh, but but I want to just add, like, an extra layer of commentary to this is that I think that this problem is especially big for practitioners because all we report are interesting successes. You know, like, so uh, we've got to think a little bit about the, um, the incentive structure for practitioners is such that um, publishing what we learned is not really encouraged unless it's a case study we can put on our website or websites. We don't 
report failures, null results, or uninteresting results. Uh, and I'm going to comment that for him here too, just so he can just so he can see it. But but yeah, I don't know. I mean, this is this probably isn't directly relevant to his article, but like it's just uh, something that's kind of been racking around in my brain for a while. Um, maybe I'm going to uh, tab that there. Um, again, just showing that this is an idea that builds on that, but it, but it is a separate idea. Um, I'm also going to uh, tag Alina Hallinan. She she's another practitioner that I know um, of applied behavioral science. She particularly works in uh, market research, which is outside of my domain, but. I, I think that her work is interesting, and she also talks a lot about the incentive structures um, of academia and of practitioners and uh, what that creates, what sorts of behaviors that creates. So this is a thought that she might be interested in. Um, so I'm just going to tag her so that way maybe in the future I might like be able to send her a note um, and just mention it. Okay. Issues with replicability have important implications for behavioral practitioners as the evidence-based nature for their diagnoses and interventions is one of the cornerstones that makes the whole effort valuable. Um, as the evidence-based nature of their diagnoses. Okay, yeah. Uh, even if the academic research, it is... I'm gonna, just going to tell them it out. Uh, even if the academic research is just a jumping off point, the time, effort, and costs saved by starting with a narrow, more concise search space can be hugely beneficial. Uh, this value gets diminished if the evidence underlying the initial assumptions is shaky. In fact, it is easier to see how a faulty foundation here can do more harm than then good. Uh, more generally, replicability issues can erode credibility and trust uh, that those in the field has have worked so painstakingly hard to uh, build. A bunch of grammar errors, <laughs> grammar errors in here, but you know this is a rough draft that he sent me. Um, okay, so I, I want to unpack some of the claims here. Um, He's saying that if academic research is just a jumping off point, and I think that's that's what it should be, you know, like ultimately, uh, for reasons I've cited earlier, academic research may not generalize to applied settings. So, you know, at best, it's usually a jumping off point. Uh, but, uh, but I think that he's also right that we want our initial assumptions to be uh, our initial assumptions to be strong, you know, like, so if, if I'm going to be referencing an academic study and using that as a jumping off point, it should probably be a good jumping off point. You know, like I don't want to, um, I don't want to jump off like, um, like a floor that's just going to collapse underneath me. Uh, so I'm just going to also comment here, This value gets diminished if the evidence underlying... Well, mm, I don't think my comment here is necessary. So I I just think that like with this paragraph, it's kind of hard to see what his point is. You know, like, so I think that the point is... Is that, you know, like, if I'm trying to make a decision as a practitioner, then I'm going to be better off by by starting with what I already know. And if what I already know is academic research, then, then that is, then that's going to, that basically just means that I don't need to search through as broad of a, 
literature base. Uh, this point here, more generally, replicability issues can erode credibility and trust um, entirely. That's an entirely separate thought from the rest of this. Um, I'm just going to It's a little hard to tell what point you're trying to make here. Are you saying generalize um, academics should or of exist in research. Fortunately, there have been some great initiatives in recent times led by rock star researchers like Brian Nosek, uh, Sanjay Srivastava, uh, John List, uh, Simen Vizier, I hope I'm not offending anyone uh, with my pronunciations of their names, um, and many others. Initiatives like open science and the introduction of experimentation protocols features like pre-registration are good examples of this. In addition, there have um, been efforts to create better incentive structures around replication studies and the importance of doing work in the field with larger samples. Um, collaboration with government and private sector institutions have also helped provide researchers access to the numbers needed to reach the required statistical power. Um, a nice example of this is the ongoing collaboration between Harvard Business School and Commonwealth Bank. Okay. I don't think this re hmm. about replication incentives. Mm. Not sure if this addresses that. Yeah. Um, or so, so there I'm referring to my comment about how practitioners don't really have an incentive to report anything but like uh, amazing successes in our case studies. Um, and I don't think, I'm not sure how this comment really addresses that. Or at least, you know, like I'd be curious to see what he means by better incentive structures um, to see what he means by it. When, like when I'm trying to think of a better incentive structure, you know, for, for applied practitioners, yeah, I'm, get, I'm just gonna write this down like, Uh, what what would be a 
better incentive structure for applied practitioners applied behavioral science to encourage open reporting and mutual learning. Um, and I'm just going to tag this as an important question. Uh, so, so that's something that I do that is meant to, oh gosh, where, where, where'd my loom thing go? Well, maybe you won't see, see my picture right now, but 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 yeah, so that's something I've been doing is I've been tagging important questions, uh, which are just things that I want to like continuously ponder. Um, and and I actually got an idea from Andy Matuszczak that I really like and want to explore more, which is applying spaced repetition to those. You know, so maybe what I do is I put this important question on a on a spaced repetition schedule, and then every time that every day that it pops up for me, I would add a new thought to it. So you know, it's here right now. I'll just add a quick thought to this. Um, maybe we should instead. Learn from uh, maybe we need a better way to cite each other. I don't see citations among practitioners often, right? And um, I'm I'm also just going to make a note to myself. At. So, so there was a conversation that I had in a Slack group recently that was talking about, about the fog behavior model. Um, and, you know, like fog behavior model that comes from BJ Fogg, it's very popular in use by practitioners and non-practitioners alike because it's just very, uh, very simple to use and it's... Um, it just comes with some good general rules of thumb. But BJ Fogg actually copyrighted it and um, and is very sensitive about how the model, in particular about how the model gets used. And, and the model is also like very basic and general in structure. He's basically saying that um, cost benefit, if cost benefit is... If benefits are larger than cost, if people have more motivation than they have like ability to do something and they get prompted to do it, then they'll do it. And that's just a very broad thing. That's like saying costs benefits, you know, like that's an idea as old as time. And the guy copyrighted it. And so there's like a little bit of controversy within practitioners about that. Um, and, and, and I'm just making a note to myself, uh, Link myself to that conver. Uh, link this note to the conversation about the fog model. You know, be and, and that's relevant because um, because one of my thoughts during that was that BJ, you know, perhaps. Because people aren't citing each other, like uh, like a copyright might be the best solution. Copyright might be the best best solution to not getting cited, you know. And, and I don't think I, I ideally wouldn't have that be the best solution. Let's move on to the next point: unknown boundary conditions. Uh, behavioral informed interventions have proven to be more or less effective given the presence or absence of certain conditions. Uh, therefore, gaining a better understanding of the context in which an intervention achieves a particular behavioral outcome is important for practitioners. 
this goes back to what I was talking about earlier, where like lab experiments are generally trying to remove all aspects of the context. You know, like I think personally, I think that generalizability uh, is misunderstood at this point. Like I would put so much more credence into a whole bunch of field experiments that all find the same general thing. And then we pay attention, um, as he mentions here, uh, and, and we just pay attention to the context in which that intervention achieves the behavioral outcome. Right. Okay. So I'm on, I'm on board with that so far. Um, a good example of this is the famous energy con conservation. Well, actually, you know what, let's look and see if I had any, if I had any comments on this at the time. Oh, I just said, I agree with this so hard. <laughs> uh, that, um, the hashtag C right there marks that that was like a comment in response to his Twitter thread. Uh, just meant to differentiate what he wrote from what I wrote. Okay. A good example of this is the famous energy conservation inter intervention popularized by O Power. Uh, using previous research conducted by Cialdini and others, they found that by showing citizens how their electricity consumption compared to that of their neighbors, uh, the social benchmark, uh, led to a marked, a marked reduction in energy usage. Um, what's often not discussed about this study is that there was also a boomerang effect. Uh, those citizens who were doing better than the social benchmark actually regressed. Uh, they slacked off on their energy savings as a result of seeing the social benchmark. With hindsight, this makes sense. Social benchmark perform social benchmarks are performance agnostic. Uh, the mechanism drives conformity, not energy conservation per se. Um, understanding the social benchmarking intervention is effective, but may have adverse effects for those who are better than the benchmark um, is an important boundary condition, which can help practitioners to understand boomerang and big mistakes. Okay, so I mean like this, this paragraph right here, you know, like I think that it points to something really important, you know, which is that, which is that like, oh, power, they, they used previous research, they used academic research that had already been done as, as, you know, like help it as a jumping off point for what their intervention was. And so what they essentially did is that they showed people this is how your energy usage compares to the energy usage of those who uh, are your neighbors. And, you know, like people who were below that average, they ended up, they ended up attempting to save more energy that next month because they didn't want to be below their neighbors. And the people for who were above the benchmark uh, didn't end up saving as much, you know, in, in fact, they actually like this, this intervention actually backfired. Uh, they decided to, or decided they, they ended up slacking a little bit because they were like, you know, I'm already pulling my weight here. Uh, I'm doing better than is expected. So maybe I don't need to work as hard for next month. Uh, I'm just going to comment here. Social benchmarks are performance agnostic. The mechanism drives conformity, not energy conservation per se. Um, I, I don't think that this is the right explanation for this. I don't think... For this, because, because what happened is they actually iterated a little bit and the people who did better than benchmark, they just gave them a smiley face, you know, like they literally added a smiley face to it, which was essentially just saying like, Hey, you did good. And, uh, in giving that feedback, like, thank you for doing that. And, and then that boomerang effect went away. And so I don't really think the issue is conformity. 
you know, um, or at least the thinking about it as conformity takes some of like the human elements out of it. Um, okay, so I'm just going to comment that um, sm smiley face emojis to those who who did better than average removed the boomerang effect. Um, conformity doesn't feel like a very human explanation for this. Though it, it could be accurate, you know, like, like it, if what he's saying is like, okay, people are just going, uh, people are just going to like regress to the average. Um, I suppose that works. True. People who did better than average I'm and, and, and I'm going to say that like those sorts of explanations, like I'm pulling more than my weight and others aren't. So why should I, you know, like it's, uh, it's, it's anthropomorphizing, um, a subconscious process. Uh, which which isn't always the best practice, but at the same time, you know, I guess it just gets to a bigger question here, which is that if we're really trying to understand people, may should we be giving more human explanations to their behavior? Is that actually beneficial? Uh, the reason why, like, something like this, like, I'm pulling more than my weight and others aren't, so why should I? The reason why that might not be the best way to do this is that there are a lot of different people who could be not doing, who could have been reducing increasing their energy consumption for a whole variety of reasons. I don't really know. Um, the experiment, I don't think, really said, uh, gives all too many clues beyond, like, my inference here. But I'm also just going to write down... I don't know if this is an important question, but... Uh, how human should our explanations of behavior be? How much intention and homunculized I don't even know if that's a word, but I'll know what I mean. <laughs> uh, reasoning. Can we place on these experimental results? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll call that an important question. And I'm calling that an important question because I think that's just, you know, like it's it, it it's 
towards this idea of how do we know what's true and like what interpretations of reality can we take as accurate? Because, you know, like interpreting evidence is an air is the domain of intuition to an extent. And I want to have the most effective intuition possible. And I also want to know like what the limitations of my intuition are. Um, so, so, so I'll count that as an important question. Um, but I'm just going to put this in here uh, as a reference so I remember what I was initially talking about. Um, hashtag quote. And I'm also going to link my comment so I remember my original thought. Back to, back to this. So we know that these boundary conditions are there and we know that they're important. The problem is that the characteristics aren't well understood for the majority of existing interventions, even in the contexts where they're commonly used. In saying this, there has been much more discussion of boundary conditions lately. This, in combination with independent variables being studied over a variety of contexts, more field studies, bigger samples fault allowing for subgroup analysis, and more meta-analyses should lead to exciting developments here uh, in the years. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that for sure. Full agree. In the ideal situation, practitioners would set up, okay, combinatory effects. Um, in the ideal situation, practitioners would set up isolated experiments. Oh, I actually also want to pause real quick here. You know, so I've got here like comp um, complementary crowding out effects. That's the same as combinatory effects. Again, this article is based on a tweet thread that uh, David put out a while ago. Um, I'm, I'm going to review those, but I want to wait until after I've read this. Uh, so that way it's not shaping my look through this right here. I want to have, I want to increase the likelihood that I have more unique thoughts in response to this. In an ideal situation, which also, which also goes to this just general point of like, what's the role of review in my knowledge management system. Like, when do I want to review what I've already written? And when do I want to not? <laughs> and, and I feel like if I want to generate totally novel thoughts, a lot of the time it's better to just start from scratch. Um, and, you know, start from there. And then next, I would go back and look through all of the thoughts that I'd already thought about it. And then try to generate more connections and thoughts from there. I think that'd be ideal practice right there, but I'm not sure to what degree I can just say like that as a blanket rule, but I'm going to write that down for myself. Um, just so I remember that when I want to generate not or what is the role of review in writing to think? If I want to hashtag term personal knowledge management, if I want to generate totally Yeah, just put uh, an asterisk next to that because like how novel really is it? 
um, without reference material, then I would look through past plots and try to generate new ones. Possible instance. And um, if I want to generate totally novel thoughts, and then uh, review past thoughts when I have writer's block. Okay, so real quick, uh, learning through going up and down the ladder of abstraction, uh, that just refers to an idea that I've uh, that I have about essentially like when I'm working on something, uh, I might do something specific or I might might make a specific point. But then I usually try to ask myself, is there a more abstract version of this? Uh, and then I have something that's a little bit more generalizable. Then I can try applying it to other specific situations. And in doing that, I can see how generalizable something really is. I can adjust my mental models appropriately. I think it's good knowledge work practice. Um, and then <laughs> reviewing past thoughts when I have writer's block. I actually used to have uh, a routine. I, I haven't been doing it as much anymore, but like I want to do it again. I have this app called Fabulous which, you know, it's like meant to help people create healthy routines, you know, so like you wake up in the morning and you have a morning routine and you would like list out the steps in them. And so it's kind of like a habit tracker that lets you group things into routines. And I had in there a creativity routine, which was uh, to just like review my reference material, go on a long walk with my voice recorder and, you know, just like let my mind wander as I go. And then once I get back, I would just start writing. Um, and that comes also from some research that finds that exercise. Um, if you start exercise leads to people being a little bit more creative, you know, like it just, uh, it, it activates those parts of the brain. Um, I don't really know how to describe this specific research on that uh, much, but it's something that I've just experienced in my own life as well. So I've chosen to just believe it. And, and I remember the findings were basically saying that like, okay, um, do creative work immediately after exercise. Like if I'm going on a long walk or if I do like a, like a heavy workout, immediately start writing. So, so that was my creativity routine. Um, I'm also just going to, uh, what's today's date? May 7. Okay. And I'm just going to move this over here. Oh yeah. I just subscribed to Andy. Uh, he's doing good work. Uh, I want to support him. Okay, so back to the article. Combinatory effects. In an ideal situation, practitioners would set up isolated experiments to test the effects of different interventions and how those compare to the effects of interventions when they are combined. This is rare. In practice, it is commonly the case that a combination of interventions will be tested all at once. The problem is that although there may be a strong evidence for particular interventions, the combi uh, leveraging temporal landmarks or setting implementation intentions, I don't know what temporal landmarks is, I might look into that later, but um, the combinatory effects of two or more interventions are often less well understood. Um, like a program that uses uh, temporal landmarks in combination with implementation prompt, uh, intentions prompts to get people exercising. 
This isn't often discussed as a concern because intuitively it makes sense that piling interventions on top of each other increases the chances of solving the behavioral problem. This is a dangerous assumption though, however, as counterintuitive crowding out effects may exist. Uh, more might be better, but it also may not be. Mm, I'm just going to comment here, give them an example of this. Example of this is crowding out in with. So, so in behavioral economics, crowding out just it refers to any time, any time where the relative price effect is not true. So the relative price effect is saying that if prices go up, people buy less. If prices go down, people buy more. Um, same is true with like wage. If people get paid more, they work harder. If people get paid less, they work less hard. Um, and, you know, the crowding out effect is basically saying that, you know, sometimes adding more financial incentive does not actually work. Uh, in fact, it crowds out motivation and reduces output. But in, in terms of this general, this general, uh, claim you know, where he's saying, where he's saying that, like, comparing the effects of interventions when they're combined, he, he doesn't want, he thinks it's a dangerous assumption to just compare, combine interventions and assume that it's going to work. And that's true. But at the same time, at the same time, like, real world situations are complex. Right. And in every intervention that we do, like it's got it's it, it's usually got some trade offs. Like I implement an intervention and I'll find and, and I might say like, oh, this improves this situation, but harms this situation. So like I might want to say like, OK, is there another intervention that can cover my bases? Right. right. And, and so I guess like what I'm trying to say here is that the real world's super complex. So I don't know to what degree I can actually, I can actually assume that just one intervention is going to do the trick. Um, I think that his complaint is valid, but I think it's hard to deal with in practice. Hmm. I'm going to write this one down. He says that combinatorial effects are not well understood, and it's a dangerous assumption to think that two interventions that we know, know <laughs> work in isolation will work well together. And not crowd. I, I believe that this is just hard to deal with. Real world situations are complex, so I don't think I can assume just one intervention will work. At the same time, 
the world situations are complex, so I don't think I can assume just one intervention will work. At the same time, gosh, what was I thinking there? I'm going to move on to a different thought and come back to that, um, which is... I believe that understanding, oh, yeah, at the same time, because these combinatorial effects are not well understood, we need to take our best guess. <laughs> on occasion. At play. Well, I'm going to come back to that thought because I've got another thought I want to write down real quick and I'll remember that. Um, I should see. Understanding combinatorial effects the same amount of complexity. Have you tested X plus Y. Oh, wait, we didn't <laughs> notice that um, W How does that come into play? Can't use our intervention now. You know, like, uh, it just, that's, that's a hard, this is a hard problem <laughs> to get around. Uh, doesn't surprise me that we haven't really figured it out so far. Um, and, and I'll also say this is something that I've thought was an issue for years and years and years. You know, like, um, yeah, how, how do all of these things work in combination with each other? Because, like, behavioral economics, for example, you've got, like, a like an entire just gigantic list of heuristics and biases. But all of those, all of the experiments that were built to identify those uh, isolated factors, so that specific heuristic was all that would really... Uh, be shown or be in play. But like in a real world situation, things are complex. There's a lot of, um, there's a lot of problems at play. So I just don't know what the good solution is uh, to this. But, but I do believe that understanding the mechanisms and boundary conditions at play will uh, support better hypotheses about what works well together. Also, understanding the problem very well will help as well. Academics are focused on, are generally <laughs> focused on, on interventions, which are solutions. Whereas pr uh, practitioners need to focus on problems as well. Okay, I'm I'm gonna copy paste this stuff in for him.
I'm just going to edit this for formatting because Notion just bleeded all of those comments together when they're all separate comments. Um, okay. Mm, I'm also going to reorganize things here just a little bit because uh, I think that this idea builds on that. So turning that into a child node as opposed to something separate as as opposed to a sibling node okay studying the combinatory effects of interventions isn't a common research area perhaps this is because the underlying psychological mechanisms are more interesting to academic behavioral scientists and this sort of research becomes much harder to do when you have more moving parts. Uh, however, with intervention combinations being less the exception and more the rule in practice these days, it would be valuable area for more rigorous investigation. Gabriel Ettingen's WHOOP framework is a useful paragon for researchers and practitioners to look to if we want to make progress here. Okay, so studying combinatory effects of Interventions is in a common research. Yeah, so I wanted to comment on this part here. Um, I don't know if that's true that they primary that academics primarily study mechanisms. I mean, I guess they try to isolate mechanisms, but hmm, just think about this for a second. Uh, so I mean, like usually. Uh, oftentimes in really good studies, you'll see they did like five separate experiments in order to really try to understand what's the, what's the mechanism at play here. I, th I, I, I think that, that what I'm getting at is that these field conditions, like doing a whole bunch of field experiments that all find similar things. I think that the boundary conditions are what actually uh, tell you what the mechanisms are. Um, that boundary conditions from many field experiments or other sorts of work and findings in the field are really what tell us what the mechanisms are. Um, hmm. Perhaps this is because are more so than a paper okay um he says that Academics are looking for psychological mechanisms more than anything. I, I, I think that's true. And a lot of my understanding of mechanisms uh, comes from that. It comes from that. But ultimately, those mechanisms are the researcher's 
interpretations of those results. I might need to look at the data and methodology a little more closely on my own and try to see if my interpretation differs from theirs and do that before I read their interpretation. Hmm. Okay. Um, and you know, what I'm going to want to do, I think at some point is really figure out like what is, I, I want to break down personal knowledge management a little bit because I, I think that what I'm actually trying to get at here is, um, knowledge work best practices or really just knowledge work practice which is what I was getting at earlier with this I mean I guess I can I, I can start you know and just tag it but but eventually I'm gonna make a page and I'm gonna actually like go through my personal knowledge management stuff because those notes are going to be in there um and really go from there. Okay. Uh, knowledge, work, practice. Knowledge, work, practice. Okay. Hmm. Okay. I think I'm going to cut off, uh, I'm going to cut this off right now and I'll let you, I'll let you read the rest of the article if you're, if you're interested in this. I found this to be very fulfilling of a practice. I don't know if, uh, I don't know if this is going to be interesting to anyone, at all, but I, I I thought it was I thought it was fun, and it made it so I engaged much more deeply with the subject matter here. And this is an article that really deserves to be engaged with on a deeper level. So yeah, I I might be doing more of this. Maybe I'll do like a live stream, even at some point. Who knows? Thanks for watching.